Welcome, New Life family. And, oh, I just remembered that usually when I'm here and I say, Welcome, New Life, I've got a congregation that will say back to me, Welcome, or whatever. So this, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to say it again, and then just go to your chat, and then just type it in there. So, Welcome, New Life family. Okay, good. All right. And I also want to welcome any visitors that we might have that have chosen to worship with us today. It's great to be here. It really is great to be here. I'm looking around the room and I'm looking at how it is right now. And I can certainly say with confidence, I can speak for the, our whole staff when I say, I'll be so happy when we can all gather and assemble under one roof together again. But it's not for right now. So one thing I know with assurance that we as believers, wherever we are, whether we're watching our TV, watching our laptop, watching our desktop, watching our phones, over at your mom's house, at your house, wherever you are, one thing that we know with assurance, we're still, we will always be, and forevermore, we will always be connected because of our relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So, with that being said, before we enter into our time of praise and worship, what I want to do today is I want to read out of a passage, familiar passage that's found in Psalms 100. So if you've got your Bibles, you want to go to that, or if you're not, you can just follow along. And then after that, we'll move into our time of praise and worship. It says in Psalms 100, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Here's the important part. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. So if you're at home watching, you can stand up if you want to. If you can sit down, you can raise your hand. Take any posture you want and join in today, right now with us, as we enter into praise and worship. For this is the day that the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. So we're going to just take a few moments to let the Lord know that he's mighty. I want to know I have about two or three witnesses that don't mind typing in the comments, Lord, you're mighty. Come on, Lord, you're mighty. Fill the atmosphere with Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're faithful. Lord, you're worthy. There is nobody like you. Hey, hey, hey. We've come to declare that there is no one greater than you. Hey. So put those hands together like this. Come on. Hey, right wherever you are. Come on, make a joyful noise into the Lord. Say, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Say, Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, Lord, you're mighty. 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 Oh, Lord, you're mighty. Oh, Lord, you're mighty. Oh, Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Mm. You said your glory.
Lord to mighty. Hey. Lord to mighty. Lord to mighty. Lord to mighty. Hey, Lord to mighty. Hey. Everybody 
Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're so come mighty. on, right where you are, just begin to declare that He's Lord, mighty. You're mighty. I don't know what your situation Lord, is, but He's mighty over Lord, that. I don't know what the situation Lord, looks like, mighty. but come on, decree and declare, Lord, Lord you're mighty. Can I show you? Come on, decree Lord, and declare that He's mighty. He's mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Lord, you're mighty. Oh, that he's mighty type he's mighty hey, if you're a witness to the mighty works of the lord come on let the redeemed of the lord say so he's mighty he's mighty when i look back over my life all i can say is the lord you're mighty lord you're mighty you're mighty you're mighty you're mighty hey hey can He's mighty. He's mighty to save. He's mighty to heal. He's mighty to deliver. He's mighty to set free. Is there anything too hard for God? The answer is absolutely no. Hey, you're mighty, you're mighty, you're mighty, you're mighty, you're mighty, you're mighty. And we worship you, we worship you, we worship you. We worship you. Head up us. We worship the mighty king. And he loves it when his sons and daughters sing to him. Hey, hey, hey. He loves it when his sons and daughters worship him. For the Bible says that they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. For the father is seeking for such. The father is looking for you to worship him. Come on, slip your hands right where you are. One thing I decide Only this has Just to dwell, dwell, dwell Here forever And this will be my pasture Laying at your feet Oh, just to dwell, dwell, dwell Here forever Father, closest friend, closest friend, you are most beautiful, you are most beautiful, dearest Father, dearest Father, closest friend, closest friend, you are most beautiful, you are most beautiful, who one thing I desire. Only this has just a dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. And this will be my passion, laying at your feet. Oh, just a dwell, dwell, dwell here forever. Dearest Father. Dearest Father, closest friend, closest friend, you are most beautiful. You are most beautiful, dearest Father. Dearest Father, closest friend, closest friend, you are most beautiful. You are most beautiful. Say, dear. Father, close 
there's nothing left our love seems to right where you are we worship you there's no one more beautiful than you Jesus we worship you, you, you. you're the ancient of day we worship you from this day to that day for forever and eternity we worship you we worship you. 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 we 
I just want to come and say thank you. You surprised me. I got caught. I got caught off guard. I got caught by surprise. And I want to thank all of you for driving through and uh, wishing me a happy birthday. It was encouraging. It was uplifting. And I want to say a shout out to the staff, to my family for making this already a great weekend. And so once again, thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your Friday evening to come and just wish me a happy birthday. So God bless you all. And this is why I love my church. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> Today we're going to continue our series that we've uh, been studying called um, Your Mind Matters. Your Mind Matters. And what I want to do is invite you to turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to begin reading at verse number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 10, and we're going to read at verse number 3. Paul writes, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We're talking about in this series, your mind matters. And today, what we want to deal with is winning the war in your mind, winning the war in your mind or winning the war for your mind. 
The mind matters. Why does the mind matter? This is what I believe. I believe that our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thought. Our mind is always moving, excuse me, our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thought. Our lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thought. Or another way to put it, we're always heading in the direction of our most dominant thought patterns. If I were to say it this way, I were to say that our minds are like a GPS. And what happens is our bodies, our life, our emotions, our behavior responds to the instructions that's given by our minds. Whatever is charted, whatever is scored in our minds will be the music and the melody of our lives. I want you to hear that again. Whatever is charted, whatever is scored in our minds will be the music and the melody of our lives. What I tried to share with you on last week, and I think it's so important, I tried to argue, I tried to share from a biblical and a clinical foundation that our behavior and our emotions are all impacted by what we think. That's why Proverbs 23, 7 says it this way, what a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In other words, what a man thinks drives, dictate his behavior, his attitude, his emotions, and his feelings. And in order to change our lives, we have to change our thinking. One of the things I believe is that we act out what we believe to be true. Whether it's true or not, we act out, we live out what we believe to be true. Uh, Our minds influence our emotion, impacts our behavior, control what we do. But the question on the floor today is what or who is controlling our minds? This is very important. If how we think impacts how we feel, if how we think impacts how we live, then the question we need to ask ourselves is who or what is controlling our minds because who or what is controlling our minds will impact our emotions and will impact our behavior. That's why this is so important. And that's why we're talking about what I call a battle for who's controlling our minds. We're talking about a battle for what will control our minds because like we said, that, that we live out, we live out what we think. See, we live out what we think. Uh, our behavior and our emotions are predicated on what is circulated and what is percolating in our minds. And we have to ask ourselves who or what is controlling our thinking. And that's why this text is so important because what this text reminds us of is this idea that there is a battle. There is a fight, there is a war to control your mind, to control your thinking, to control your thoughts. And if you look in the text this morning, I want you to notice the language of warfare. Paul says it in a number of ways, and you see this idea of warfare. Verse number three, we do not war according to the flesh. Verse number four, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. Verse number five, taking captive of every thought. I want you to see the language there of warfare. Because what Paul is really getting at in this text is the idea that we have to be intentional. We have to fight. That we are in a battle for who controls our thoughts. What I want you to understand is this. A lot of our defeats or our victories originate in the mind. See, a lot of whether or not we are victorious or whether we are victims start with what's in the mind. So often we want to control or we want to change a behavior or we want to change a habit or we want to break a habit. You don't break the habit in your actions before you break the habit in your mind. 
If you don't break that bondage of the mind, if you don't break the bondage that that's existing in your thoughts, then you're not going to break the bondage that's existing in your behavior. If you want to change that behavior, if you want to see freedom in your actions, if you want to see freedom in your emotions, then you have to experience freedom in your thinking. And that's what Paul is going to talk about here. This idea of the fact that we are in a battle for who controls our thoughts. And so I want to ask the question today, how do we win the battle for the mind? How do we win the battle for our thoughts? Well, I think Paul outlines it for us, and I want to share what Paul says. Here's the first thing that I think Paul would say is how to win the battle for our thoughts. Number one, I think he would say we capture, capture every thought. We capture every thought. Look at verse number five. He says, and we are taking every thought captive. That word taking every thought captive is really one word in the Greek, and it's the word capture. We, we are capturing every thought. I want to play with a couple of words here. I want to play, first of all, with the word every. That we are, we are to capture every thought. I want to play with the word every for a moment. Because what Paul says here is that he, he helps us understand this reality that, that, that every thought has potential. He wants us to understand this when he says that we capture every thought because what he wants us to understand, listen to this, is every thought has the potential to produce something, right? This is what I want you to understand. He says we capture every thought, every thought, every. I want to underscore that word every. If you're studying with me in your Bible, I want you to circle that word every because what Paul says is we take every thought thought captive we capture every thought and the reason that he says every thought is because he wants you to understand every thought has the potential to produce something every thought has the potential every thought has the power to produce something it, it's like a seed this is what Paul says he says our thought is like a seed and he says as small as a seed may be a seed has the potential one seed one grain one seed has the potential to produce something this is what Paul says Paul says every thought has the potential to produce something and let me tell you about a seed a seed will always reproduce after its kind and so this is what Paul says. Paul says, every thought has the potential to produce after its kind. In other words, a spiritual thought is going to produce a spiritual harvest. A positive thought is going to produce a positive harvest. Watch this. But a negative thought or a carnal thought is going to produce after its kind. Paul says, I want you to take every thought captive. Why? Because every thought has the potential to produce something. This is what Paul wants us to understand. Paul wants us to understand what it means. Watch this. Like a seed. To seize the seed. Seize the seed. Capture every thought. Let me tell you why he wants us to capture every thought. He says here, don't take, like, just like a seed. Don't take any thought. No matter how small it may be, don't take any thought lightly. Don't take any thought for granted. Don't underestimate any thought because every thought has the potential to produce something in your life. This is what Paul wants us to understand. He says, for all the thoughts that circulate through your mind in a given day, he says, what I want you to do is I want you to give an account. I want you to hold, watch this, every thought accountable. In other words, I don't want any thought I don't want any thought to permeate through your mind that is not held accountable, watch this, for what it produces in your life. Paul says, I want you to capture, I want you to seize the seed. I want you to capture that thought. Why? Because every thought has the potential. In other words, he says, what I want you to do is I want every thought accounted for. Because this is what Paul says, no matter how small this seed is, watch this. 
Not only does it reproduce after its kind, but watch this. No matter how small the seed is, watch this. It has multiplication potential within inside of it. When Paul says here, I want you to capture every thought. And this is what we're going to get to as we begin to progress through this series. The power of our thinking. Take every thought captive. Capture it. Seize it. Don't underestimate it because no matter how small it is, a thought will reproduce after its kind. And the smallest thought has multiplication potential in it. I, I want to digress for a moment. And, and, and you're going to hear why this is important in just a moment. But just as we talk about seeds, watch this. Even weeds have seeds. I want you to hear this because we're going to come back and talk about this. Even weeds have seeds. Now, I want some of you just when I say that, I want you to get your mind right, right? If you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, that's good. But I need some of you to get your mind right, right? Even weeds have seeds. Let me tell you how that works, right? If weeds grow up in your neighbor's yard, within the weeds, there are seeds that's after the kind of that weed. That's growing up in that neighbor's yard. When the wind blows, the wind will blow the seeds from the weeds that's in your neighbor's yard into your yard so that the seeds from those weeds will infiltrate your yard. And now those weeds will be planted in your yard. Now, you have to be intentional about fertilizing your grass. You got to be intentional about developing your grass. But if you don't do anything, the seeds from weeds will naturally blow into your yard. We're going to talk about that in just a moment because what I want you to understand is the world has seeds and you don't have to do anything, but the world will blow its seeds into your mind and it will begin to plant its thoughts into your mind. We, that's going to be important in just a moment. But what Paul says here is Paul says that what I want you to do is I want you to capture Every thought. Now this thought thing is huge. Last week we talked a little bit about the clinical profession and the counseling profession. And, and so much research has been done on the mind. And so much research has been done on the brain. And here's one thing I think is fascinating as it has to do with the mind or with the brain. It's this idea that our, our mind or our brain will create something called neural pathways. Very fascinating. And that's why Paul's going to say, take every thought captive. This idea, this study that's been done is called neural pathways. Let me, let me talk about what neural pathways mean. When you think a thought and then you repeat that thought in your mind and then you reinforce that thought in your mind, by thinking that thought, repeating that thought, and reinforcing that thought with your behavior, watch this, what your mind does is create what's called a pathway. Nerves begin to connect with one another, and a pathway is created in your mind. This is huge. This is what a pathway is like, right? So it's like if I'm walking on grass. So if I'm walking on grass... Right. And I continue to walk on grass. I continue to walk in this path. I continue to walk in this path. Right. Over a period of time, if I continue to walk in this path, what will eventually happen in this grass? If I continue to walk in this path, a trail will develop. A pathway will develop. Now, this is fascinating. This is how the mind works. Now, when you walk, someone else come up, what they'll do is they'll discover this pathway that's been made through this grass, right? They can see it. It's visible. You can see that somebody has been walking through this trail. Now, if you come up, the first thing that you'll think is, oh, this must be the path. This must be the trail. This, this is the path that everyone has taken. And so the mere fact that you see this path, 
what you will do is you will walk that same trail that has been developed because what you've noticed is that's what others have done. This is what neural pathway says. When you think a thought over and over again, you begin to repeat that thought. You reinforce that thought with your behavior. Then a pathway is created in your mind. And so what a thought will do is come behind that. And a thought will say, wow, this is the path that I must take because this is the path that other thoughts have been taken. And so what now happens is your brain will default to the pathway that has been established in your mind. And so another thought will come and say, wow, we must make this pathway because this is the trail that has been cut in the mind. This is the pathway that has been developed in the mind. And so the more we think that, what happens is that becomes the default pathway because it requires the least amount of energy. Let me tell you how that works. And so if you are negative, if you think negative, if when you see things, you automatically think negative, then what happens is that negative thought will create a pathway in your mind. It will create a groove in your mind. And so now what happens is every thought that follows that thought will be negative. And so when you see something, your response, your default response will be negativity because that is the pathway that has been cut in your mind and that's why Paul talks about this idea that we have to seize every thought because if you let a thought go traveling through your mind it's going to create a pathway and that's what we're going to talk about as we move down the road why it's important to renew your mind why it's going to be important to think the mind of Christ because what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to create watch this a biblical pathway in your mind you're going to want to establish the mind of Christ in your mind because as you establish a spiritual pathway then what happens is you begin to respond to things spiritually because a spiritual pathway has been cut in your mind this is incredible this is incredible about why Paul says take every thought captive because a thought has the potential of producing a pathway in your mind which becomes the default way that you think. And so Paul says, take every thought captive. And as I mentioned, that word captive means, it, it just simply means to capture the thought. It really is one word, capture the thought. In other words, take every thought, and we're going to talk about this in just a second, take every thought and subdue it. Take every thought and bring it into subjection under the knowledge of Christ. Capture it and bring it into subjection. So what does Paul want me to do when I, when I capture that thought? This is what Paul wants me to do. He wants me, here we go, capture every thought, every single thought. Capture it. Why do I need to capture it? Because if I let it run rampant, over and over and over and over again, it's going to create a negative neural pathway in my mind. So I have to capture it. I have to seize it. Once I seize it, what do I do with it? Here, this is what Paul says. Once I capture it, I got to do a couple of things with it. I have to identify it. I have to evaluate it according to the knowledge of God. And anything that's inconsistent with the knowledge of God, watch this, I got to demolish it. See, this is what Paul says. And here's in the text. He says here that when you capture the thought, what you have to do, verse number five, any thought that's raised up against the knowledge of God or any thought, any speculation, any idea that's inconsistent with the knowledge of God, I have to identify. That means I have to label that. I have to say this thought is inconsistent with the knowledge of God. That's why in a few weeks we're going to talk about putting on the mind of Christ because as you put on the mind of Christ, then you will be able to identify that which is inconsistent with his word. Some of the things that's happening in our life today is we have thoughts that's running through our minds that we are not aware that is inconsistent with the word of God. 
Because it's popular and because it's on Facebook and because it's on social media and because it's on Twitter and because that's what everybody is saying, then guess what? You're just meditating and reflecting and going along because you don't have the mind of Christ that gives you the lens to be able to filter when you identify it to and evaluate it and to be able to say this contradicts the word of God because everybody see it. We identify it, but not but, but we, don't, we don't demolish it. We identify it and we accept it and we embrace it. And that's why Paul's going to talk about in, in next week, I believe, that there is the mind of Christ and there is the wisdom of the world. Because the wisdom of the world represents the seed that's blowing from the world's weeds. And you don't have to do anything. Those seeds are just be planted in your garden, right? And so he says here that once you capture it, you have to identify it. You have to evaluate it according to the word of God. And then notice what Paul says. Paul says here, and we have to destroy it. Verse number five. You got to destroy it. This ain't pretty stuff here. You got to crush it. You got to demolish it. Why? Because it has the potential to be destructive in your mind and you cannot play with a thought that is inconsistent with the word of God, no matter how small it is. You got to destroy it. And he says here, if you don't, let me tell you what it will do. And I'm still under point number one because this is huge. If you don't destroy that thought, And you let that thought begin to develop a pathway in your mind. That pathway then will lead to what the Bible calls a fortress or a stronghold. What happens is you will be a prisoner of a lie. You're right. If you let that thing dwell in your mind, then what happens is Paul says here, Paul says the destruction of fortresses. In other words, in other words, that lie will imp- you will be imprisoned in that lie. That, that's why it's so huge to destroy it. Because if you don't destroy it, you will become a prisoner to that lie. Let me give you an example of of of, of, of what that looks like. So um, an elephant, an elephant is the strongest land animal. An elephant is the strongest um, land elephant. An elephant can get up to 10,000 pounds. That's that's how big an elephant can get to. And I I mean, just the elephant's trunk alone. I don't know if you've ever seen an elephant just wrap its trunk around the largest of trees and pull the tree clean out of the ground, roots and all. That's how powerful, that's how strong an elephant is. Strongest animal on land. And it has the strength in its trunk alone to wrap around the largest tree and pull it out of its roots. But have you ever seen an elephant at the circus? An elephant is sitting there with a small chain around his leg. Now the elephant's strongest animal on the land can uproot a tree Roots and all, but yet it's in bondage to a chain that's about that size. How does an elephant who has that kind of strength allow itself to be in bondage by a, by a chain that if the elephant sneezes, it could break the chain? Let me tell you how that happens. When an elephant is young, the trainer puts the elephant in a chain, puts, the, puts the, the bracelet around the elephant, chains the elephant up. And so when the elephant is young and the elephant tries to move, the elephant is restricted. And so the elephant keeps trying to fight when it's young, but, but the elephant when it's young no longer, it doesn't have the ability to break the chain when it's young. And so the elephant fights, the elephant fights when it's young, but it does not have the strength when it's young to be able to break the chain. And so now in the elephant's mind, the elephant has developed a mindset that it can't break the chain. 
And so over time, even as the elephant gets bigger and as the elephant gets stronger, because the seed was planted in the elephant's mind that it cannot break the chain, the elephant no longer realizes that it has the power to break the chain within it. And so it lives in defeat, even though it has the power to break the chain. Paul says here that our weapon is of the spirit of God. What God has done is given you the power to break the chain. But because Satan has told you all of these years what you can't be, what you're not going to be, what you can never succeed, what habits you can't break. You are living in bondage even though the Spirit of God has given you the power to break the chain. That's what a lie will do. And that's why Paul says here, Paul says, notice what he says, verse number four, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh. Here we go but divinely powerful for the destruction of the chains. In other words, God has given to us the power to break every chain. And Satan knows that. That's why he wants you to live in a lie. Because if he can get you to live in a lie, he can get you to live in defeat, even though the power is already in you. And that's why you have to break every, that's why you have to capture every thought. In other words, what he says here in verse number five is every thought you have to, you have to bring it in subjection and you have to evaluate it according to the knowledge of God. And any thought or any idea that contradicts the truth of God's word, you have to demolish it. So the first thing Paul says to win this war He says you have to capture every thought. And here's the second thing, and I'm going to say this, and I'm only going to give you a piece of this because it's going to segue into next week. Now we have to change our thought patterns. We have to change our thought patterns. Not only do we have to capture it, but we have to change our thought patterns. That's why he says... Bring, bring those thoughts into obedience of Christ. We have to change our thought patterns. Now, what the counselors and the psychologists, they talk about is this idea of retraining your thinking or rewiring your thinking. But we're going to use the word renewing your mind. See, they will say you have to rewire it. They would say you have to retrain it. And the... And the, and the, and the, and the, and the the challenge with that, it's about you. We would say that you want to renew it because renewing it is what you yield to the Spirit of God to do in your mind. Right? We have to change our thinking. Now, watch this. As we change our thinking, this is what happens. We begin to change the neural pathways in our mind. Here, here's an example. So if I stop walking this path, if I stop walking that path, over time, that pathway will diminish. And if I start walking a new path, then what happens is a new path will develop. What Paul is calling us to do by changing our thinking is by changing the direction so that we're no longer walking in the pathway of negative thoughts, unspiritual thoughts, ungodly thoughts, worldly thoughts, and walking in the pathway of biblical thoughts, spiritual thoughts, uh, mind of God thoughts. And as we begin to walk in that pathway, then what happens is we'll create new pathways in our mind, and our minds will default to the new pathways that's made up of godly instructions. And as our mind defaults to those new godly pathways and watch this our emotions and our behavior will follow the new pathways that's been developed in our mind that's huge that's huge and so what he says here that I have to retrain I have to rethink I have to renew my mind by repetitiously thinking godly thoughts so this is how it works when a dominant thought impacts my mind. I have to stop. I have to identify that with the word of God. And then I have to make a conscientious decision to replace that thought with the word of God 
So that now I begin to think that word of God and that word of God now replaces that ungodly thought. That's how you do it. See, that, that, that's how you begin to retrain your mind to be able to think godly and to be able to live that out godly. It's, it's changing my mind by conforming my mind and bringing it in obedience to Christ. See, that's how you do it. Right. So I want to ask you today, th this is how you do it. I, I want you to ask yourself this question. What is your strongest thought? What, what is your most consistent thinking pattern? When you have an emotion of fear and anxiety, anger, when you have a, a, an emotion of hopelessness, I want you to take that emotion and ask yourself, what am I thinking that correlates with that emotion? Right? That's how you begin to identify. What, what am I thinking that, that generated that emotion? Here, here's a great example. See, when, when, when I have a loved one to go be with the Lord, my initial emotion is grief, right? It's grief. And that is, a, that is an honest emotion, grief. Watch this. But when my mind tells me this, here's, here's Paul. Grieve, but not like those who do not have hope, right? This is what my mind tells me. To be absent from the body is to be present from the Lord. This is what my mind tells me. My mind tells me that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. That where I am, there you may be also. That's what my mind tells me. My mind tells me that, 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 that God is tearing down this earthly dwelling and he's rebuilt. That's what my mind tells me. So, so what happens is my grief now changes because my thinking changes. And so, yes, I am saddened by the loss of a loved one. But as my mind meditates on the word of God, then it changes my grief. My grief is no longer despair. My grief is no longer hopelessness. My grief now can be turned to joy because like Paul says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But I have to dwell on that. I have to think about that so that now as I think on those principles, now it impacts my thinking. It impacts my feeling. That's why Paul says we grieve but not like those who do not have hope. Comfort one another with these words. And we can find any scenario that whatever that emotion, whatever that thought, I can give you a, a counter biblical principle to combat that negative thought. And that will impact your, your feelings and that will impact your emotions. So what are we talking today? How do I win the battle of my mind? Because it's a battle. The way I win the battle of my mind is capturing that thought, every thought, bringing it into obedience with Christ, identifying it evaluating it according to his word, demolishing anything that is not consistent with his word, begin to retrain my mind to think biblically so that I can create new pathways in my mind, which will be the default for my emotions and for my behavior. This is huge, guys. I, I want you to begin to think about what are those thoughts what are those dominant thoughts that, that you find consuming you? And I want you to put in practice thinking the biblical thought, meditating on the biblical thought, and retraining your mind to live out the biblical principle, not the negative principle that comes from either your fears or your concerns or your emotions. So let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. We pray that you would use it, Father, to build, to edify, to renew our minds. As we meditate on your word, as we meditate on who you are, as we meditate on the truth, the truth of your word. 
I pray today that you would free someone in their minds. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 What a great message from uh, Dr. Pugh. His message was so challenging and convicting. I, I honed in on the thesis of his, his message. And it, here's what it says. Lives are always moving in the direction of our strongest thought. And, and that's so true and that's so powerful that whatever is controlling our mind, that's how our behavior will, you will be seen in our behavior. And until we get a hold of that, until we hold that captive, we're always going to be in bondage. We're always going to be in prison. And so some people might be saying to, today that I feel like I'm in prison. I feel like I'm in bondage. And so what, what Pastor was talking about was what we have to, who or what is in control of our mind. And it's not merely saying, I want to get rid of what's in my mind. It's also saying, I have to replace it with something that is of stronger power than that. Dr. Bill Lawrence used to say, willpower can never defeat flesh power. And that is so true. And so right now, you might be at home watching, listening on your phones, whatnot, and you feel, I'm in that kind of bondage. I don't feel the freedom that pastor was talking about. You might be a, another person that says, I've heard about this new abundant life, and I want to experience, but I feel like I'm in bondage. Well, here's the good news. Jesus Christ has freed us from that bondage. He has defeated that so that we are able now to live that abundant life. So if you're at home right now, and maybe you have questions. Maybe you have questions about his message. Maybe you have questions about who is this Christ and what is this message and what are the words that he was speaking of that I need to replace those other thoughts with. We have people that are standing by right now. You can just, if you're watching online or live stream, you can go in and just on our chat, speak with someone. Someone will be there to pray with you and walk alongside of you to lead you to the, the plan of salvation. Today might be your day. It might be your very day. And I just want to close this in a word of prayer. Father, today, whoever is watching, who's ever listening, who's ever observed what was just preached, your word today, Father, they're crying out. They're calling out. Father, teach us how to hold every thought captive because every thought has the potential of doing something. Father, let us replace those demonic thoughts with the word of God. And Father, we, we wait with great expectations to see and to hear how you will work through our lives because of this message today. Father, we ask it through the Son and by the Spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.